previously on MBTV. There are many public maps like this and they're constantly updated. You can read every Wi-Fi network name. A couple of years ago, I discovered some things about Wi-Fi that shocked me, all because I dove into a rabbit hole after reading this tweet from Edward Snowden. I wouldn't use Wi-Fi at home because global maps of every wireless access point's unique ID, including yours, are free and constantly updated. I would use Ethernet, yes, Ethernet on a phone. Snowden said, don't use Wi-Fi, and I wanted to find out why? Apparently so did a bunch of other people because the video got over a million views. To quickly recap, when you use Wi-Fi, your Wi-Fi access point or base station is broadcasting a heap of information via radio waves and this information can be intercepted and read by anyone and some of it used to create maps like this one. Every one of these purple dots is someone's Wi-Fi network, including personal hotspots created on phones to tether other devices. Wow! Um... Okay. From the information people broadcast wirelessly via radio waves, you can learn about their devices, their habits, and the history of which Wi-Fi networks have existed across time. If you know someone's Wi-Fi network name, you can search for them in these public databases, find the ID of their Wi-Fi access point, and search that device ID. If someone's been using their phone as a hotspot, it's possible to track down that hotspot and find everywhere that the hotspot has been turned on. It might show the exact location of your home or your work work or that cafe that you visit and exactly when you go there. These maps are public. It's not just the access point that's broadcasting information. Connecting to the internet via Wi-Fi makes it easier to intercept information to and from your device itself than it would be if you were using a wired connection. For example, this device is called a Wi-Fi pineapple and it can spoof Wi-Fi networks, trick your computer into connecting to them and can monitor your internet activity. Can you pretend to be Starbucks? Yes, I can. So right now I'm connected what looks like to Starbucks, even though there's no Starbucks, but okay. actually it's the Wi-Fi pineapple. Yeah, basically. You can watch everybody do everything as they're doing it. Oh yeah. So it turns out that Wi-Fi can be a bit of a privacy mess. My two big takeaways in making that video were that a wired internet connection is better because it's harder to intercept and that I should never turn my phone into a hotspot. In this follow-up video, I'll clarify some of the points I originally made and answer a bunch of questions people had about the first video because it turns out that people had a lot. First, an update on my own internet usage. I hung ethernet cables throughout my house and have used ethernet to connect my computer ever since. It wasn't hard, I literally just used cable ties and little sticky things, no electrician required. I highly recommend it just from a purely functional standpoint. My connection is far more reliable and faster than before. And it's nice to know that whatever I'm broadcasting is harder to intercept because I'm using a wired connection. But whether I should actually be worried about anyone intercepting my data is another point, and we'll dive into that when we talk about threat models. Now, some comments on my last video. First of all, well, my Wi-Fi wasn't on the map, so I'm safe. The point of the video isn't Wiggle.net or any other website that collects this information. Wiggle.net's entire purpose is to let people know what kind of information they're broadcasting out when they use Wi-Fi. When Wiggle.net was first created 20 years ago, they wanted to let people know that there was a problem with Wi-Fi, that these Wi-Fi access points are out there broadcasting their beacons and giving away their exact location. Wiggle.net figured that once they illustrated this vulnerability sufficiently, people in the standards body that define how Wi-Fi works would take a look at Wiggle's maps and say, oh, we should do something about privacy because this is an issue at the very heart of Wi-Fi. But they never did. And Wi-Fi remains a fundamentally non-private protocol. You can be sure that even if you don't find yourself on this map, which relies entirely on community contributions, that other maps that are comprehensive do exist that you don't even know about. But you can choose to not use Wi-Fi and using Ethernet definitely makes it more difficult to intercept information. Next, your Ethernet cable does have a MAC address, therefore your video is completely wrong. So one thing I didn't quite understand when I made the video because I was learning about all of this for the first time was that every radio access point has a MAC address or a BSS ID. Your Wi-Fi base station has one. When you turn your phone into a hotspot, it has one. So does your Ethernet port on your computer. So all these people were absolutely correct and I appreciate you mentioning this in the comments. But the point of the video remains the same. It is a lot easier 
easier to intercept a MAC address being broadcast via radio waves than one that's broadcast over a wired connection like Ethernet. Does a VPN help? So a VPN takes your traffic and before sending it out to the website you want to visit, encrypts the traffic, routes it via their own server, and then sends it out to the website you want to visit, which makes that website and anyone watching think that the traffic originated from the IP address of the VPN's server. But this has nothing to do with the beacons being sent out by the Wi-Fi base station that's publicly visible to anyone watching. But how would it know your location? All it can tell is this house has Wi-Fi. It's useless information. Well, let's go through a hypothetical scenario. I know that the New York Hilton has hosted many Bitcoin conferences. I go to wiggle.net and I search for Wi-Fi access points in that location. I see a network called Bitcoin Conference Wi-Fi 2018. I see the dates when that network name has been visible. I also see the MAC address of other Wi-Fi names in the vicinity at the same time. The names are Georgia's iPhone. Satoshi's iPhone, OG Bitcoin's iPhone. Now I presume these people used their phones to tether the internet during the conference because Wi-Fi wasn't that great. So I look up the MAC addresses associated with those Wi-Fi names. I can now see every time that these phones have been used for Wi-Fi. I can draw conclusions about where these people live, which cafes they visit, where they work, their movements and their schedules. Make no mistake, as long as publicly available maps of Wi-Fi access points exist, you do not want to be using your phone as a tethering device. It's also possible that databases exist that collect the device IDs of every phone that connects to this Wi-Fi. But to be honest, if someone wanted this information, there are easier ways to get it than using Wi-Fi maps. <laughs> So these are all different SSIDs that your phone is currently trying to connect to. It's things that your phone has previously connected to in the past. I highly recommend you turn your Wi-Fi off when you're not using it and you forget networks after joining them so that your phone doesn't automatically try to connect to random Wi-Fi networks at all times. Can't you randomize your MAC address? Yes. All iOS 14 and Android 10 devices have MAC address randomization on by default. MAC randomization is where software changes the hardware MAC addresses to random strings, which can help obscure mobile devices and increase their privacy. Now, why is this important? Well, MAC addresses are increasingly used as personal identifiers for customer service, device identification, and tracking. I have a video out about how shopping malls use these to tell which stores you've visited and potentially serve you with ads and other things. So manufacturers started rolling out methods of randomizing MAC addresses in order to help protect the privacy of their users. But it's important to keep in mind that not all MAC randomization protocols are the same. Some methods still allow you to tell the make and model of a device. And this predictable randomization doesn't really provide an added benefit as it's still easy to identify and track. Well, how do I stop companies collecting my network name? Websites like Wiggle have great respect for privacy. And if you add no map to your Wi-Fi name, they will remove you from their database. But the point isn't whether someone can see you on Wiggle. It's that your information is being transmitted via radio waves that any number of people can be recording. There's very little you can do to make sure that no one is recording this information, which is why people like Snowden recommend you not use Wi-Fi transmitting beacons at all. My favorite kind of comment, well, I have nothing to hide. Who cares what I'm doing? Snowden had a great retort for this in his interview with John Stossel. We may feel like we're living perfectly normal acceptable, law-abiding lives. But laws change. Social mores change. The norms shift. Who decides what is normal, what's acceptable, and what's not? In a free society, we are allowed to be different. Once we are entered into this system, where everything we've ever done, everything we were ever interested in, everything we've ever bought, everywhere we've ever gone, everywhere that we have or anyone that we have ever talked to is instantly captured at the moment it happens and memorialized in some database somewhere just waiting to be used, uh, it will be used. Remember, this data is forever. Finally, many people commented that this is something Snowden mentioned because he's a high profile individual being targeted by one of the most powerful adversaries in the world. This is a great point. So I wanna finish off by talking about risk profiles and threat modeling. Threat modeling is the process of identifying the standard of security and privacy you want to achieve and then looking critically at risks or gaps in your devices, lifestyle and habits, etc., that could endanger that security and privacy. Most of 
of us are not being targeted by a nation state, so it's not helpful to think in terms of achieving absolute airtight privacy. But we can definitely think in terms of small changes that can get us 80% there. The mass surveillance apparatus of the world depends largely on us voluntarily giving data to companies, which is then sucked up by governments. What's more is that there are commercial incentives that are pervasive on the internet today that aren't just a risk to privacy, but are an organizing principle behind companies like Google and Facebook, whose business models depend on them collecting data about people. Facebook has even tried to punish Apple in the courts for hindering their ability to collect data without consent. All of these companies find ways to convince us to hand over data, and we comply often without realizing it. We can reduce the amount of data we hand over through many different methods. Choose communication methods that are end-to-end -end encrypted, where companies can't even access your data if they wanted to. Turn your Wi-Fi off when you're not using it so that it doesn't become a fingerprint for tracking your location. Only have apps that are absolutely necessary on your device and deny permissions that are not essential to the app. Obviously, if a nation state wanted to specifically target us and expend the resources needed to do so, we'd have to take much more extreme precautions to protect ourselves. And we do dive into some of that in other videos. But the good news is that this is a risk profile that most of us don't need to be concerned with. So, even though extreme privacy is difficult, pretty good privacy is definitely within our reach, and we can achieve a great deal just by making small, conscious decisions in our everyday lives. It's time we start to normalize privacy again in this digital age. What is it they've sent us? Hope.